After Two Years, a conversation with the President of the United States. Last evening in his office, Mr. Kennedy looked back at the first two years of his presidency and looked ahead. Talking with him for some 90 minutes were three White House correspondents, Bill Lawrence of ABC News, George Herman of CBS News, and Sandra Van Oker of NBC News. Now on the CBS television network, an hour of that conversation, edited and recorded on videotape. As you look back upon your first two years in office, sir, has your experience in the office matched your expectations? You had studied a good deal the power of the presidency, the methods of its operation. How has this worked out as you saw it in advance? Well, in the first place, I think the problems are more difficult than I had imagined that they were. Secondly, there's a limitation upon the ability of the United States to solve these problems. Uh, we uh, are involved now in the Congo in a very uh, difficult situation. We've been unable to secure the implementation of the policy which we've supported. We are involved in a good many other areas. We're trying to see if a solution can be found to the struggle between Pakistan and India, with whom we want to maintain friendly, with whom we want to maintain friendly relations. Yet they're unable to come to an agreement. There is a limitation, in other words, upon uh, the power of the United States to bring about solutions. I think our people get awfully impatient and, and uh, maybe fatigued and tired and say, we've been carrying this burden for 17 years. Can we lay it down? We can't lay it down. I don't see how we're going to lay it down in this century. So that uh, I would say that the problems are more uh, difficult than I imagined them to be. The responsibilities placed in the United States are greater than I imagined them to be. And there are greater limitations upon our ability to bring about a favorable result than I had imagined them to be. And I think that's probably true of anyone who becomes president, because there is such a difference between those who advise or speak or legislate and, be, and between the man who must uh, make, select from the various alternatives proposed and say that this shall be the policy of the United States. It's much easier to make the speeches than it is to finally make the judgments. Because uh, unfortunately, your advisors are frequently divided. If you take the wrong course, and on occasion I have, uh, the president bears the burden and responsibility quite rightly. The advisors may move on to new advice. Well, Mr. President, that brings up a point that's always interested me. How does a president go about making a decision, like Cuba, for example? The uh, most recent one was hammered out really our policy and decision over a period of uh, five or six days. During that period, the 15 people, more or less, who were directly consulted frequently uh, changed their view uh, because uh, whatever action we took had so many uh, disadvantages to it. Each action that we took raised the prospect that the, it might escalate with the Soviet Union into a nuclear war. Finally, however, I think a general consensus developed uh, and certainly seemed after all alternatives were examined the course of action that we finally adopted was the right one. Now, uh, when I talked to members of the Congress, several of them suggested a different alternative when we confronted them on that Monday with the evidence. My feeling is that if they had gone through the five-day period we had gone through with looking at the various alternatives, the advantages and disadvantages of action, they probably would have come out the same way that we did. I think we took the right one. If we had had to act on the Wednesday in the first 24 hours, I don't think probably we would have chosen as prudently as we finally did a quarantine against the use of offensive weapons. In addition, uh, that had much more power than we first thought it did because uh, I think the Soviet Union was very reluctant to have us stop ships which carried with them a good deal of their highly secret and sensitive material. Another, uh, one of the reasons I think that the Soviet Union withdrew the IL-28s was because we were carrying on very intensive low-level photography. Now, no one would have guessed, probably, that that would have been such a harassment. Mr. Castro could not permit us to indefinitely continue widespread flights over his island at 200 feet every day. And, he, and yet he knew if he shot down one of our planes that uh, then it would bring back a much more serious reprisal on him. So it's very difficult to always make judgments here about what the effect would be of our decisions on other countries. In this case, it seemed to me that we did pick the right one. In Cuba of 1961, we picked the wrong one. I'd like to go back to the question of the consensus and your relationship to the consensus. Uh, you have said, and the Constitution says, that the decision can be made only by the president. 
Now, what was your relation to the consensus? Did you form no opinion until the consensus appeared, or were you part of forming the consensus, and had you disagreed with it? What then? Well, I think that, uh, well, you know, that old story about uh, Abraham Lincoln in the cabinet. He says, all in favor say aye, and the whole cabinet uh, voted aye, and uh, that all opposed no, and Lincoln voted no, and he said the vote is no. So that uh, naturally the Constitution places the responsibility on the uh, president. There was some disagreement uh, with the course we finally adopted, but the course we finally adopted had the advantage of permitting other steps if this one was unsuccessful. In other words, we were starting, in a sense, at, the, at a minimum place. Then, if that were unsuccessful, we could have gradually stepped it up until we had gone into a much more massive action, which might have become necessary if the first step had been unsuccessful. I would think that the majority finally came to accept that, though at the beginning, much sharper division. And after all, this was very valuable because uh, the people who were involved had particular responsibilities of their own. Mr. McNamara, Secretary of Defense, therefore had to advise me on the military capacity of the United States in that area. The Secretary of State who had to advise on the attitude of the OAS and NATO. So that, uh, in my opinion, the majority came to accept the course we finally took. It made it much easier. Cuba of 1961, the advice of those who were brought in on the executive branch was also unanimous and the advice was wrong. So that, uh, and finally, and I was responsible, so it finally comes down that no matter how many advisors you have, frequently they are divided and the president must finally choose. The other point is something that President Eisenhower said to me in January 19, he said, there are no easy matters will ever come to you as president. If they're easy, they will be settled at a lower level. So the matters that finally come to you as president are always the difficult matters and matters which carry with them large implications. So this contributes to some of the uh, burdens of the uh, office of the presidency, which other presidents have commented on. During the Cuban crisis, there was some problem, which you're apparently familiar with and bored with by now, about the possibility of a president talking in very private and secret conversations with his advisors, and that was somehow leaking out. Do you think that this is going to inhibit free, frank flow of advice that every president has to have? No, I think it, uh, it's unfortunate when there's sort of conversations, but there are, what, 1,300 reporters accredited to the White House alone. There are, I suppose, uh, 100 or 150 people who are familiar with what goes on uh, because uh, in the Security Council meetings in one way or another, you've got the people who are actually there, and you've got others who are given instructions as a result of the decisions there, and I suppose people do talk, and then there's the I said at the time of the Cuban disaster of April 61 that the success is a hundred fathers and defeats an orphan. Uh, I suppose when something goes well, there's more tendency to uh, talk uh, at all levels. And frequently the reports are inaccurate. I would say the security is, is pretty good at the National Security Council. It's unfortunate when it's breached. Is it true that during your first year, sir, you would get on the phone personally to the State Department and try to get a response to some inquiry that had been made. Yes, I still do that uh, when I can because it's, uh, I think, the, there's a great tendency in government uh, to uh, have papers stay on desk too long. And that, it seems to me that's one really of a function. After all, the president can't uh, administer a department, but at least he can be a stimulant. Do you recall any response that's, that you received from somebody who wasn't suspecting a phone call in the State Department? specific response somebody made to you? Uh, no, they always uh, respond. Uh, <laughs> they always say yes. <laughs> but it takes a little uh, while to get. You know, after the, uh, I met Mr. Khrushchev at Vienna and they gave us an aid memoir. It took several, many weeks to get our answer out through the State Department coordinate with the British, the French, and the Germans. It took much too long. It seems to me we've been able to speed it up, but this is a constant problem various departments. There are so many interests that are involved in any decision. No matter what the, the decision is about Africa or Asia, it involves the Europe's desk, it involves the, the desk of the place, it involves the Defense Department, it might involve the CIA, it frequently involves the Treasury, it might involve the World Bank, it involves the United Nations delegation. So it seems to me that one of the functions of the President is to try to uh, have it move with more speed. Otherwise you can uh, wait while the world collapses. You uh, once said that you were reading more and enjoying it less. Are you still as avid a newspaper reader, magazine? 
remember those of us who traveled with you on the campaign. A magazine wasn't safe around you. Do you? Oh, it is. No, no. I think it's uh, invaluable, even though it may cause you uh, some. Uh, it's never pleasant to be reading uh, things uh, frequently that are uh, not uh, agreeable news. But I, I would say that uh, it's an invaluable uh, arm of the uh, presidency as a check, really, on what's going on in, uh, in administration. And more things come to my attention that uh, cause me either concern or give me information. So I would think that Mr. Khrushchev, uh, operating a totalitarian system, which has many advantages as far as being able to move in secret and all the rest, is a terrific disadvantage not having the abrasive quality of the press applied to you daily to an administration. When you have, even though we never like it, even though we don't, uh, even though we wish they didn't write it, even though we disapprove, there still is, there isn't any doubt that we couldn't do the job at all in a free society without a very, very active press. Now, on the other hand, the press has the responsibility not to distort things for political purposes, not to just take some news in order to prove a political point. It seems to me their obligation is to be as tough as they can on administration, but do it in a way which is directed towards getting as close to the truth as they can get and not merely because of some political uh, motivation. Mr. President, uh, in the light of the election returns, which at the congressional level at least were certainly a defeat for the Republican hopes, how do you measure your chances for significant success domestically in the Congress just ahead? Well, I think we'll be in about the same position in the last two years. I think that, uh, as I say, what we have that's controversial will be very closely uh, contested. Did the complexion of the House change a little bit by the shifts? I would say it's slightly against us more than it was. We're not quite as good shape as we was for the last two years. But uh, we're about where we were in the last two years, which means every vote will be three or four votes either way when you're you, losing. Do you have a very crucial vote at the outset on this Rules Committee fight again, do you think? And, uh, I hope that the Rules Committee is kept to its present uh, number because we can't function if it isn't. We might as well that we're through if we lose. Uh, if, if they try to change the rules, nothing controversial in that case would come to the floor of the Congress. In other the words, the program, in my opinion, would be emasculated. As a young congressman, sir, you voted to impose a two-term limitation on the president. Now that you've held the office for a while and also observed its effect on President Eisenhower's second term, would you repeat that vote even if the amendment did not apply to yourself? Yes, I would. Uh, I would. I, I know the conditions were special in 47. Uh, but uh, I think eight years is enough. And I'm not sure that a president, if he's, in my case, if I were re-elected, uh, that you're at such, such a disadvantage. Uh, there aren't many jobs. Uh, that isn't the power of the presidency, patronage at all. That's their field in the first month. Most of those jobs belong to the members of the Congress anyway. So patronage isn't a factor. I think there are many other powers of the presidency that run in the second term as well as the first. Mr. President, on that point, the fact is President Eisenhower has great influence today in the Republican Party and therefore in the country and has great influence in foreign policy. He doesn't even hold office. In some ways, his influence is greater in some, to some degree. So that uh, and the same is really true of uh, also of President Truman, President Hoover. I don't think that uh, it depends on uh, the, the influence of a president uh, still substantial uh, in his second term. Though well, I haven't had a second term. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Uh, President, <laughs> on that uh, point, much of your program still remains to be passed by the Congress. There are some people who say that you either do it in the next two years or it won't be done should you be elected to a second term. Do you share that point of view? You know, in the first place, I think we've got a lot by. I was looking at uh, what we set out to do in January 61 the other day and on... Uh, taxes and on uh, Social Security welfare changes, and area redevelopment, minimum wage, the Peace Corps, the Alliance for Progress, the democracy and strengthening the defenses, strengthening our space program. We did all those things, the trade bill, not perhaps to the extent in every case of our original proposal, but substantial progress. I think we can do some more the next two years. And I would think that there are going to be new problems in 60, if I were re-elected in 65, and I would, I don't think, I don't look at the second term as necessarily a uh, decline. I don't think that at all. In fact, I think you know much more about the position. It's a tremendous change to go from being a senator to being president. The first months is, uh, are, are very difficult. But I have no reason to believe that a president with the powers of this office and the responsibilities placed on it, if he has a judgment that some things need to be done, I think he can do it just
just as well the second time as the first, depending, of course, on the makeup of the Congress. The fact is, I think the Congress looks more powerful sitting here than it did when I was there in the Congress. But that's because when you're in Congress, you're one of 100 in the Senate or one of 435 in the House. So that you're, the power is so divided. But from here, I look at a Congress, and I look at the collective power of the Congress, particularly the block action, which it wants to, and it's a substantial power. Mr. President, power like charities, you know, it begins at home. And you seem to have one view of what we need to do at home, and Congress seems to have another view. A lot of money will be appropriated for defense and national security, but there's a certain reluctance to devote money to another form of capital investment, education, and other things like that at home. Is it purely a question of money, or is this religious thing really going to make it impossible for you to get the Education Act passed? Well, education, it's uh, certainly the question of how the funds will be distributed and how they will be shared uh, is uh, one of the factors. Uh, the uh, integration question is another uh, matter which comes into it. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson once said to expect the people to be uh, ignorant and free is to expect what never was and never will be. Uh, here we're going to have twice as many uh, people trying to go to college in 1970 as 1960. That means we have to build as many buildings in 10 years as we built the whole 160 years of our country's history. Then you've got these millions of young boys and girls who are either dropping out of school, who are unskilled at a time when unskilled, uh, when skilled labor is needed and not unskilled. So we need money for vocational training to train them in skills, to retrain workers, to provide assistance uh, uh, funds for uh, colleges and then to provide assistance to those who are going to get doctorates, higher advanced in engineering, science, and mathematics. We have a severe shortage there, and yet we're asking for the space, defense, and all the rest. The Soviet Union is concentrating on this. So all this requires funds, but it's all in controversy. Some people feel the federal government should play no role, and yet the federal government, since the Land Grant Act and back the Northwest Ordinance, has played a major role. I think the federal government has a great responsibility in the field of education. We can't maintain our strength industrially, militarily, uh, scientifically, uh, socially without uh, very well-educated citizenry. And uh, I think the federal government has a role to play, so we're going to send up a program. Unfortunately, because of the fact, as you mentioned, and other reasons, uh, we've come close to getting assistance to education passed, but we haven't been successful. Mr. President, is your problem getting an education bill through this year made more difficult by the events in Oxford, Mississippi and, and the yes. uh, use of federal troops there? Yes, I, I think so. Well, I think so. Do you, how will you combat this new... Well, as I say, uh, we've got once, uh, this is a case of where uh, we've come very close. President Eisenhower came close. We came close once. We got a bill through the House, uh, through the Senate, almost through the House. We didn't get it. And another time for higher education through the Senate, the House, then failed. The conference failed. Now Oxford, Mississippi, which has made this whole question of the federal government and education more sensitive in some parts of the country, I suppose that's going to be a factor against us. I don't uh, really know uh, what other role uh, they would expect the President of the United States to play. The court, made up of Southern judges, determined that it was according to the Constitution Mr. Meredith go to the University of Mississippi. The governor of Mississippi uh, did, uh, opposed it, and uh, there was uh, rioting. Uh, against Mr. Meredith, which endangered his life. We sent in marshals, and after all, 150 or 60 marshals were wounded one way or another out of four or 500, and at least three-fourths of the marshals were from the South themselves. And then we sent in troops when it appeared that the marshals were going to be overrun. I don't think that uh, anybody who looks at the situation could think we could possibly do anything else. Could possibly do anything else. But on the other hand, I recognize this caused a lot of bitterness against uh, me and against the national government in Mississippi and other parts. Uh, and uh, though they expect me to carry out my oath, Constitution, and that's what we're going to do, but it does make it more difficult to pass an education bill. But I think we shouldn't penalize this great resource of our youth for all these reasons. Instead, we ought to do the job and get, some, and get these schools built, these teachers compensated, and higher education available to all these boys and girls and every time I drive around the country, that's all you see are six and seven and eight and nine-year-old children who are going to be pouring into our schools and colleges. And every governor will tell you that's his major problem, providing educational facilities for the national governor's responsibility. If we could return for a moment to this subject of the president's responsibility in foreign affairs. Now, when 
some congressmen disagreed with your course of action over Cuba on that Monday, the responsibility you had by the Constitution was very clear. But in domestic matters where responsibility is divided, how do you use the presidency, in Theodore Roosevelt's phrase, the bully pulpit, to move these men who really are kind of barons and sovereigns in their own right up there on the hill? Have you any way to move them toward a course of action which you think is imperative? Well, uh, the Constitution and the development of the uh, Congress uh, all give advantage to delay. It's uh, very easy to defeat a bill in the Congress. It's much more difficult to pass one. To go through a committee, say the Ways and Means Committee of the House, the subcommittee and get a majority vote, the full committee and get a majority vote, go to the Rules Committee and get a rule, go to the floor of the House and get a majority, start over again in the Senate, subcommittee and full committee, and in the Senate there is unlimited debate never bring a matter to a vote if there's enough determination on the part of the opponents, even if they're a minority, to go through the Senate with the bill, and then uh, uh, unanimously get a conference between the House and Senate to adjust the bill, or if one member objects, to have it go back through the Rules Committee, back through the Congress, and have this done on a controversial piece of legislation where powerful groups are opposing it. That's an extremely difficult task, so that uh, uh, we struggle for a president who has a program to move it through the Congress, particularly when the seniority system may place particular individuals in key positions who may be wholly unsympathetic to your program, may be, even though they're members of your own party and political opposition to the president. This be, uh, is a struggle which every president who's tried to get a program through has had to deal with. Uh, after all, Franklin Roosevelt was elected by the largest majority in history in 1936, and he got his worst defeat few months afterwards the Supreme Court bill. So that uh, they are two separate officers and two separate powers, the Congress and the Presidency. There's bound to be conflict, we, but they must cooperate to the degree that possible. But that's why no President's program is ever put in. The only time a President's program is put in quickly and easily is when the program is insignificant. But if it's significant and affects important interests and is controversial, therefore, then there's a fight, and then the President is never wholly successful. Mr. President, which is the better part of wisdom? To take a bill that's completely emasculated, that you had great interest in, and accept it, or accept its defeat in the hope of building up public support for it at a later time? Oh, I would say, given the conditions you described, I think it'd be better to accept the defeat. But that usually what has happened, and what has happened to us in the last two years, a good many of our bills passed in reasonable position. Not the way we sent them up, but after all, the Congress has its own <coughs> will to uh, and own feelings and its own judgment, and they are close to the people. The whole House of Representatives have just been elected, so that uh, it's quite natural that they will have a different uh, perspective than I may have. So I would say that what we ought to do is get do the best we can, but if it's completely emasculated, then there's no sense in having the shadow of success and not the substance. Mr. President, in this exercise of presidential power, I think perhaps the best known case, and the most uh, widely talked about, was your roll back of steel prices after they had been announced by the steel company. Uh, some people have suggested that in retrospect, perhaps you would not have acted so vigorously. Is there any truth in the suggestion? No, uh, I must say I think it would have been a very serious situation if, uh, though I don't like to break overall uh, fires, I think it would have been a serious situation if uh, I had not uh, attempted with all my uh, influence to try to get a rollback because uh, there was an issue of good faith involved. The steel union had accepted the most limited settlement that they had had since the end of the Second War. They had accepted it three or four months ahead. They did it in part, I think, because uh, I said that we could not afford another inflationary spiral that would affect our com competitive position abroad. So they signed up. And then when their last contract was signed, which was the Friday or Saturday before, then uh, steel put its prices up immediately. But it seemed to me that, that was, uh, the question of good faith was involved, and that if I had not attempted, after asking the unions to accept a non-inflationary settlement, if I had attempted to use my influence to have the companies hold their prices stable, I think the unions could have rightfully felt that they had been misled. In my opinion, it would have endangered the whole bargaining between labor and management, would have made it impossible for us to exert any influence public point of view in the future on these great 
labor management disputes which do affect the public interest. So I have no regrets. The fact is we were successful. Now supposing we had tried and made a speech about it and then failed, I would have thought that would have been an awful setback to the office of the presidency. And I, I just think that uh, looking back on it, I wouldn't change it at all. There's no sense in raising hell and, uh, and then not being successful. There's no sense putting the office of the presidency on the line on an issue and then being defeated. Now an unfortunate 